NBA. Um, although I, I think he had a nickname that was given to him by a broadcaster for the games that is arguably uh, a fun name or a good name. I thought it was a little too aggressive, the Alaskan assassin. But at any rate, this is uh, the man who helped father that gentleman. And he, has, uh, he was a really good uh, person that Brother Andy liked working with a lot in terms of native education, the university system, etc. Please welcome Steve Langdon. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, that's usually how I am best known uh, throughout the world, is as a result, the father of. So that's, and that's not a bad thing, of course. <laughs> but uh, it's my great pleasure um, to be here for the conference, to see friends, to learn things, and to have the opportunity to um, be able today to introduce um, uh, uh, Mr. Bob Sam, who's going, who's who I believe is an extremely appropriate speaker for the location in which we are having this particular um, uh, uh, clan, clan conference. Um, <clears throat> Bob is of the Aquan in terms of his descent and his, uh, his name, his Klinkit name, Shagunasta, has some deep, deep ties to this land and to uh, the relationships that were established here by his clan and his clan ancestors of the Tlinedi clan. Uh, I believe that Bob is has also in his life that his name is related to one of the most uh, significant things that he's known for in his life and one of his callings, one of his callings as a young man being raised in Sitka was uh, the caretaking of all of the cemeteries in Sitka to ensure that those ancestors uh, in their places were being honored and respected by the contemporary generation and those going forward. So he began taking care of the uh, <clears throat> Orthodox Church Cemetery first, and then through the course of his life, he also uh, became um, taking caretaker of uh, Indian River Cemetery, the National Cemetery, and the City Cemetery. And through his, through his behavior, through his commitment, he really made uh, a great difference in terms of the community of Sitka's understanding of the importance of ancestors. And uh, I, have, uh, I have just enormous respect for Bob's um, attention uh, to those matters. And he has since for carried forward other ma aspects of cultural heritage in, in, an, ex in an extraordinarily strong pos positive sense. So uh, I look forward to hearing his remarks today. And, and here's um, uh, Robert, Robert Sam, known as Bob Sam. I'd like to thank the Klan Conference for allowing me to be here today. It's a real honor for me to be speaking on the first day of the Klan Conference and welcoming you. I'm not very good at public speaking, to be honest. It's, it's, it's a struggle to be in front of a group of people. But thanks to the training I received, I finally became comfortable. My Tlingit name is Shaganasta, and I was born and raised in Sitka, but my family is originally from Hawk Bay. <clears throat> One of the things I really became aware of is your Tlingit name and how important it is to find out the story or the history of your name, where it comes from and, 
and just getting to understand who you are and where you come from. I'm a caretaker. I take care of cemeteries and ancestors. It's something I've been doing my whole life. And everything I do is for making sure that our ancestors are properly taken care of. Starting very young, I was really shocked at how Native American graves and human remains were treated and how cemeteries were neglected and forgotten by our own people and how development and economic development in housing and jobs were so important and our cemeteries were neglected. 33 years ago, I saw many of our headstones knocked over, many young people drinking and do, doing drugs in the cemetery, <clears throat> and many of them were our own young people. And that first summer of cleaning up the cemetery, there was enough trash and garbage to fill up this whole room. And it took us all summer long to, to clean that cemetery. I didn't know at the time that this was going to be my life's work. And I didn't know that my Tlingit name was actually tied to the work that I do. Shaganasta is a very old name. It goes back to the origin of my clan and the origin of how we came to Juno. Kawa'i is a clan leader and he was also an Icht shaman. He had another name, Shaganasta. And Shaganasta roughly means how a mountain goat received a human face. And it also mean, taught us how to respectfully treat the dead or how to treat the bear and the mountain goat. <clears throat> and it goes back to the time when our people used to go to war. And many of the warriors were preparing for war. And they would often go hunting in the forest and when they would see a bear or a mountain goat, they would mutilate the animal, tear him up. And up on the mountains, high up on the mountains, were the mountain goat people. They would watch how we would treat the dead. And they were shocked by it. Finally, a young man decided to go mountain goat hunting. He prepared himself and went up into the mountains. And the mountain goat people, they found him and they took him into the mountains further. And in the mountains, they looked just like mountain goat people, mountain goats. When they took him into their home, 
and fed them, they became human beings, just like us. And their homes were just like ours. And in time, he became just like the mountain goat people. And they took a set of horns and they put them on his head and they began to talk to him. And they told him, you shouldn't treat mountain goats, bear, and other animals. You shouldn't tear them apart and throw them in all directions. You should treat the dead with more respect. This man, this young man, was up in those mountains for a long time. And the people, they missed him. So often his friends would go up and look for him, but they couldn't find him. Finally, another young man, his friend, purified himself, did all that was necessary for him to prepare to go up into the mountains. And when he went up there, he saw the mountain goats. And he could recognize his friend. But by then, his friend has lost how to speak English, Clinkett. And because he was purified, he began to talk to him. And this man went back to the mountain goats and he told them, it's time I went back to the world of human beings. So he came back among us and he told the people, to stop mistreating the dead and to treat the bear and the mountain goats with dignity and respect. So from that time on, our people really began to settle down more. I've been doing cemetery work my whole life. And I realize how important Clinkett names are. And I realize when you're given a name, you live up to your name. And you do all that is necessary to be a good human being. So I'm very honored to do the work that I do, taking care of our ancestors. Before I came to the Klan conference, I went up to the cemetery. I cleaned up all the artist graves that I've known in Sitka. Sitka Charlie, Sitka Jack, Rudolph Walton, Silversmith Jim, all the famous artists. I cleaned their graves because I know their names are going to be mentioned this week. And in our culture, if you mention any of our ancestors, you clean their graves first. That's our custom. So that's what I did. And I also went to clean the Kaguantan graves before I came here. My father's people, that's how much I care about them. And I also went to clean the Chukanedi to show how much I care for them. Also, I went to clean the Dachloedi graves. 
When you clean your ancestors' graves, something very special happens to us. We become better people. If a headstone falls over, we go up and put it back up because the descendants, something special happens to them. So I believe our culture is coming alive because of how we care for our dead. I really believe that. And I will spend the rest of my life making sure that our ancestors are properly taken care of with dignity and respect. Ganeshtish for my short speech. Thank you. My eyes are welling up a bit as um, Bob Sams was speaking. I was recalling a brief conversation with my sister. Um, we buried my mother a year ago, and I was to have been back uh, in on the Northeast Coast and to honor her and bring flowers to her grave. And because of the government furlough, I was not able to travel. So. I appreciate what you shared about respect for our elders, for our family, and for the care of, of their grave sites. So thank you for doing that. Um, my name is Beth Pendleton. I'm the regional forester with the U.S. Forest Service. I'm located here in Juneau, but I have the, the honor to work across southeast Alaska, the Tongass, and uh, the Chugach National Forest um, up around Prince William Sound and down on the Kenai and in the Anchorage area. Um, but I'm, I'm here today really to introduce um, a speaker. Um, and I would really like to thank the Klan Conference organizers, and particularly Alice Taff and Ishmael Hope, who I see sitting over here with his family, um, for welcoming Forest Service participation during this luncheon today. Last year, I had the opportunity to participate in the conference in Sitka. And I recall uh, very warmly the opportunity to listen to actually Ishmael and to Lance Twitchell, who were interviewing elders and recording their histories. And what a choice experience that was for me to observe that respect uh, and the interest in learning about um, culture. Um, in 2011, what I want to carry this theme, though, about names and the importance of, of names, in 2011, I had the opportunity to participate in a signing ceremony for the renaming of a creek on Prince of Wales Island near the community of Heidelberg. This is a, a creek that's an important tributary uh, to the Harris River and was very... In, continues to this day and for, for time and memoriam it's been very important to the people there on Prince of Wales Island. So we were able to rename this creek working with the tribes and communities on Prince of Wales who worked with the Forest Service to submit a proposal for the renaming of the creek. And the name that was given uh, is Hundalai Hana, Hundalai Hana, which means beautiful stream. So today, I'm just really honored to introduce Bob Francis. Uh, Bob works in our cartography area for the Forest Service. And he's here to provide some information on the Forest Service's role in naming of geographical features on the National Forest System lands. Bob has been in the Alaska region as a cartographer since 2003, and he oversees uh, management and development and revision of forest visitor maps and topographic maps. He's the regional representative who also works with the geographic names and works with the Alaska State Geographic Names Board as well as the U.S. Geological Survey on naming issues. Prior to his career with the Forest Service, Bob served with the U.S. Army 100 or 10th Special Forces Group as a Green Beret. 
And he also, during his service, worked with indigenous people throughout Europe and the Middle East. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Earth Science and Human Geography. And Human Geography examines the relationships between people and the land. He also has a tremendous value for language and is a graduate from the Defense Languages Institute in Monterey, California, where he studied German. So it's an honor to um, invite Bob up to share with you about how we can work together on the renaming of important geographical areas uh, on the Tongass and Chugach National Forests. Bob? Thank you very much. And like Bob, I'm not a very good speaker myself. Um, so if you bear with me, um, I appreciate it. First of all, I would like to thank the council members for allowing me this opportunity to speak before you. It is a great honor, honor and a privilege to, to be here to address you today. Beth, I'd like to thank you for your support and your encouragement that you've given me over the past 10 years. I've known Beth for, for quite a while, and without her support, I would not be here right now. She has lent her support in the naming of Handele Hana, the beautiful stream down there in Prince of Wales Island. Without her, it would have been nearly impossible for that to take place, so thank you very much. Bob's talk was very touching to me because it touches very dearly to the core of my soul because to me, family is everything. And that's speaking off the record, and that's coming from my heart. I'm very close to my family and to my ancestors also. So I have a deep respect for them, and I hope I can relate that to you here today also. So my first slide today, if you bear with me real quick, I'll reach over here. It'll probably start off a little boring here, but I have to start off with sort of like the, the diagram chart here that most governmental people start off with, which is the flow chart of how the geographic name process kind of works. The, a name proposal is put forth, somebody puts forth a name, and it'll go to the U.S. Board of Geographic Names, and they'll send it down to the state, or the state receives it, and then the state will take that name and they'll send it down to to us at the Forest Service and down to you at the tribal, uh, down to the tribes, down to the, um, down to the city councils and so forth and send out for your recommendations, for your comments on, on that things. At the same time they send it to us. What we do at the regional office is that we will get in contact with the district ranger out on the ranger districts and we solicit information from the district, from the local people in the local area, because we want the comment from the local people themselves. It's very important for us to get that. Also, what I do at the regional office is, is I take that proposal, and then I take, the, uh, take that proposal, and then I take a look at it, and I dissect it. And I look at it and I say, does it meet the criteria that are set forth in the policies and procedures that Washington, D.C. has set down for our guidelines? And I see if it meets those criteria, And does it follow the meaning of it? And then I make a recommendation to the districts and so forth. And then we bring those recommendations back and then we make recommendations. And then your recommendations are sent back to the states with, along with our recommendations, they go back to the state. Then the state will make their recommendations to the U.S. Board of Geographic Names back in Washington. Now you notice I'm only saying the state, and you notice my little comment over to the side, the state can only make a recommendation to the, to the U.S. Board of Geographic Names. They do not make the final, recommend, or the final approval of the name. That only comes from the U.S. Board of Geographic Names. So then once the U.S. Board of Geographic Names receives that final packet, they will review that packet but they also take all that information and then they also do a review of that name and that packet too. They just don't take the state's uh, recommendation on it. 
they don't take our recommendation on it. They actually do a review of that name too and try to find as much information on that feature as they can themselves. And then they go in ahead and they render a decision on it. So any information that they receive up until the time that they make the decision on that packet, they take into consideration. One thing that you'll notice on there is that the state board does have a representative, which is Jonathan Ross, who's up out of Homer, Alaska. He is a uh, appointee by the governor to the, to the Alaska State Board. He is the native representative up there, and he's your representative on the state board for geographic names. And then there's also another one appointed also in native representative on the U.S. Board of Geographic Names who is a voting member. And the Forest Service also has one voting member on the U.S. Board of Geographic Names also. And what I don't have up there is that we also work directly with our representative too. So when I send a packet forward to the state, I also send a packet directly to my representative in Washington, D.C. and work very closely with her. And when she found out that I was giving this uh, presentation today, she was very excited and said if we do give another presentation or have a panel next year, that she would be more than willing and would love to come out and be a part of that panel as a discussion and to talk geographic names with you too at that level, on, at, with you. She would love to do that. So moving on, and hopefully this is the most boring part of, of, of the presentation. Um, but it's very important, but your feedback and your comments to the U.S. Board of Geographic Names, they take it very seriously and it weighs it very heavily on that side. And if you ever have a chance to look in the policies and procedures, I know it's very boring and I get, kind of puts me to sleep sometimes too. If I need to go to sleep at night, I pull it out, read it, and it puts me right to sleep. But they, they weigh it very heavily when they hear back from the tribes and the clans. They, they, they pay very close attention to them and what you have to say. So we'll move on to the next slide here. This is, this is the regional philosophy, and my philosophy too, is that the people and the land work together to create the landscape we live in, to create who we are. I'll give you a second, go ahead and read that. These two sentences here go straight to me, to who I am. This is the way I feel about names. Names tell a history, they tell a story. They connect us with the land and the land connects us with our ancestors. They tell us who we are, they tell us where we came from. The land is, is we're interconnected with it. We shape it, but it shapes us. The theme of your conference here today is sharing your knowledge. It brings excitement to me because sharing your knowledge with your young ones, with your grandchildren, with your children, with your generations to come, is something that we should not lose. It's something that we should, we should preserve and pass on down to them through generations to come. And hopefully today we can find ways that we'll be able to do that. Hopefully we can build a partnership, some type of, of network here today that we can actually find ways that we can We can preserve these names that you have on the landscape so we can pass them down from generations to generations to come. These are some of the policies that, that I look at when I receive a, a geographic names that comes into the office. They go right to the core of how we look at names. We want to preserve historical and the beauty of the landscape. We don't want to take the name and we don't want to pollute the landscape with and throw names all over the place. If you take a map and you put it down, you have a pristine landscape. But once you start throwing all different types of names all over the top of it, it becomes polluted. It's like throwing trash on top of everything. 
you can put a name on something, but if it doesn't have a history behind it, there's no meaning behind it. That name has to tell a story. It has to tell it has to tell a life of something behind it. It has to show something that means something behind it. And that's why Native American names are so important to us and to our lives. The second portion of that line comes directly out of the Geographic Names Policy Handbook. It might be a little bit shocked there, but that's just a little excerpt that comes out of it, and they are very serious about it. They do support Native, Native American names out of there. So, And the last one is from me, is that I am here to help you if I can, to help guide you, to help you understand these policies and procedures that we have, to help you to preserve these names. As these names come to me, I would like to establish networks and people out there that I can have contacts with. So when I get these names, if it happens to be a feature, a mountain, a stream, a creek, or whatever that happens to be in your backyard, if I have a contact out there, I can call and say, hey, they want to name this peak after uh, such and such. What's the story on this peak? Does it have a name? What's the history on it? Is there something we can do about it? And if, if there is a name, a feature that has you know, that history on it, we can put that down and we can submit another proposal on that and say, look, U.S. Board of Geographic Names, this feature already has a name. This is what it is. This is the history behind it. It would be wrong to name it that name. It needs to be named this name. And here's our supporting documents. Here's the supporting information behind it. And put that information forward to them. Along with that, if a feature already has a name on it and we can't get that feature renamed to its proper name that's been historic, there's a process that we can still preserve the natural name, the old name that was there, as a name that resides in a, in a big database system. But when you pull up the name, if somebody looks up the name uh, McGinnis, Mount McGinnis, there'll be another name that'll pop up along in a list below it that will have the Navy Clinkett name below it. And it can actually have a translation underneath of it saying what the name means and how to say it and its history behind it and what it means. So it's another way that we can preserve another portion of your history for your future generations to, to learn from so we don't lose it. It's just another database system that we can put it into so we can preserve it for future generations. I know I'm running short on time, so let me keep going on. This is from down on Prince of Wales Island. This is from the signing of the Gondole Hana um, signing down there. It was quite a turnout. It was a very good event. This event brought the entire island together, the entire tribes. All the clans came together for this one signing. It was quite an event and it was wonderful to see so many people come together and work for one purpose on this. We had the Heidelberg, Corporate, Corporate, the Heidelberg Corporation, Cooperative Association, Viola Burgess was instrumental in this. Also the organized village of Kassan, Richard Peterson, who I worked extensively on this. He allowed me to work with him. He gave me a cell phone number, gave me his email address, personal things, and he allowed me to call and contact him any time that I needed, had any information with him, that I needed anything. He was right there and he, he took care of me the entire time. He was instrumental. It really helped me a lot in understanding everything that was going on down there. So I need to thank him personally for that. We had the organized village of Kassan. I already said that. The Craig Tribal Association and Klawak Cooperative Association were all part of this, made this come to pass. Out of that, this last year, there was another name proposal that came out of that, um, that came up that was for Kenneth Eichner. 
and most of you know the Eichners and that, who was a longtime um, bush pilot out of Ketchikan, and well deserving of having, we felt, having a, a, a feature named after him here in, in Southeast Alaska. He had done a lot for a lot of people, had saved a lot of lives. And however, the the tribes of, of, of Prince of Wales felt it would be better, he would be better served if there was a feature closer to Ketchikan where he lived most of his life in, in that area. He felt he would be better served if there was a feature named in that area for him. And the ranger for that area who had been working with them during the naming process wanted to honor the their decision on that. And so we, the Forest Service, backed the tribes on that issue and did not offer, did not render our support to that to the U.S. Board of Geographic Names. And as a result of the tribes um, not wanting to um, the name, have that feature named after Eichner on Prince of Wales Island and us not wanting to, not offering our support of it, the U.S. Board of Geographic Names actually turned down the naming of that proposal on Prince of Wales Island. We did take uh, a little bit of, of heat, you could say, for that from the Ketchikan News uh, paper and so forth of that when it came out in the papers that um, we did, but we felt it was important to support our tribal relations that we had and that we had worked so hard to gain down there. But we have worked out with, uh, with the people down there to find another place for them to name an appropriate feature after him for the work that he had done. But that just shows that we take it serious, our tribal relations that we have down there and that we've worked so hard to gain. And we will in the future to do that. This one here is up in Yakutat, and I'm hoping I'll be able to say this one here correctly. But what I want to say on here, this is Kushin Hunsuka. I'm sorry if I say that incorrectly. Um, but this is actually an, an administrative name. It's not a geographic feature name. So. There's, there's a difference. Geographic feature name is like a, a stream, um, a mountain, a peak, something like that. But this is more of an administrative name, so it's a man-made feature um, that's done. So this is actually one of the one of the first names in that that we've actually placed on a map that's a facility that has actually been named with a... Um, is it... Clinkett? Yeah, a Clinkett uh, name out there so and we're working on those right now the next one that we have going and that's on the new force visitor map that's coming out which will be going to print in a week and a half and it'll be the new Yakutat force visitor map and so they're getting their first map out there and it'll be on that one so whoops wrong way okay now this one here is <laughs> the Hin Thrakhin um, ex uh, Experimental Forest. A lot of you are familiar with this. This is the Akwan. Um, worked very hard in cooperation with the Forest Service and the Foreign Science Labs to come up with this name. And it was a great accomplishment. And I know that Lillian and Ruth and everyone are very very pleased and are very honored to have worked with you guys to come up with this and are very proud of everything that that transpired around it and this is also another administrative name it's not a geographic feature so there is a difference between administrative features and geographic names but i wanted to bring out the relationship of being able to work with the tribes and how important it is for us to work together and how important it is to build the relationships that we have going And now we're back down to Prince of Wales again, way down south. Um, in here, we have, um, right in the center, you can barely see them standing over 
in the background in there, we have Tony Christensen, who is the artist who made the beautiful sign that you see sitting there for the Handele Hana, which is stream beautiful, actually, from what I've been told. It's actually back, you know, it's uh, that way. But, um, and the diacritical remarks should be the other way around, but, uh, but it was done. But he made the sign, and then we have Viola. And if you notice on your uh, handouts on your tables, there's a beautiful um, quote from her in there. And unfortunately, I was never able to meet Viola. But I did watch a video of her. And every time I watched it, and I just watched it the other day again, and it tugged at my heartstrings once again to, to listen to her and what she had to say. And the quote in there, it makes me more of a family here on the island. To know that, that we had a part in doing that, to bring the clans together, the tribes together, to be more of a family, to help them in some way. It makes me feel better inside, and I hope I can regain that feeling inside with me by helping you to help your ancestors and your sons and your daughters keep that in their lives too. I only have one more slide to show you. And I'll just try to let the slide speak for itself. But as you look at the slide, take a look at their eyes. And I'll let the slide speak for itself to let them to see what they're trying to say to each other as they look at each other. I think the slide speaks for itself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. I just wanted to uh, keep you up here for a second. Um, uh, before Bob spoke, uh, we had a chance to chat a little bit. Wanted to ask which communities have uh, place names projects going on or have had uh, some place names projects worked on? I know Sitka has. I thought Angoon had. I know Huna had worked on some. Wrangell had had some Clinkett place names projects going on. Uh, I know Sitka Tribe of Alaska worked on uh, an electronic format. And so I just, uh, maybe it, it is uh, the staff who work at those different tribes that would uh, be knowledgeable about those place names. But how many believe that their Clinket traditional place names are important? How many want Bob to change everything for you? <laughs> well, I hope you brought some business cards, Bob. You have some work to do. But how about, uh, how about uh, giving a round of applause to both Beth and for Bob for working with us on this. And he says he has place names. David? What was the name of that screen before you changed it? The name of the street was a military acronym, which I really don't like to um, use. If you want, I will, but um, it was named FUBAR. Um, a lot of people won't know what it means, but from the Vietnam era, it's a pretty derogatory type name. And to be very nicely put in a polite way, it's fouled up beyond all recognition. Uh, we're not aware of that one, so if you want to get with me afterwards, we can take a look at it. 
And the the reason why that stream um, the did not that that stream did, actually was not an official name. It just had a name that people that someone had given to it a long time ago, and they just started calling it by that name. So we was able to name that stream without changing the name. So that was a much easier process than was to try to rename a stream. But I would love to meet with you in a few minutes and find out what the other stream name is and see what we can do on it. Yes? There's a, um, there's a street that goes over to Costco and they call it Anka Street. But the people of, the, of this area named it Anka. There's a big difference between Anka and on cop. And it came with respect to the gentleman that spoke earlier, as well as some of the other people, and it's recorded in, uh, uh, on a recording at the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. And uh, so the uh, question that I have is, is there a way to research how that name came about, and if it was the, same, the attempt to give the same name that the Tlingit people gave, but they spelled it incorrectly. Is there a way to correct that? That's on a street name? Yes. Okay. We only, unfortunately, I only deal with geographic names, which is geographic features, which is peaks, streams, and so forth. That's a, that's a geographic place. It's the city of Juneau. Yeah, but it's the city of Juneau. It's a street name. So it's it's a man-made feature. And so it's, it's handled by the city of Juneau. So they'd be the ones you'd have to approach on that. And I would assume it was going to be a much easier process to change than trying to go through the federal process. I would hope. Yes? In Sitka, there's a stream that they've been named, no name. Everybody that lands on the ferry terminal will see it as they go to sit down. I don't know who mm -hmm. named it that, but there's an official looking sign that says no name creek. But there is a name to that stream, a very geographically descriptive name. The mm -hmm. stream in the shadows from the mountain. Okay. The fish swim up that stream because it's too dark. The alders cover it. It's between two mountains. It's a very dark place. So they named it the Stream in the Mm hmm. We should have that because the thing is, even if they didn't, couldn't even think of a better name than Melanie Street. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you all probably have places like that in your communities, but you might want to start with because that's the easiest one to start with, one that has no real name. Is it for a service land or a city? It's right next to the ferry terminal. It's, uh, so it's on part of the city. It's part of the city. Okay. It's cleared out. I have another point, though. Yes. When, or question, how would you ask a question? When will the Alaska State Legislature ask again the federal government to change the name of Mount McKinley. <laughs> yes. I'd just like to make a brief comment. Yes, sir. I think the U.S. Forest Service uh, actually should be given recognition to actually report to our our indigenous native people relating to the smokehouses. And uh, it just stop with smokehouses. I'd like to see the, uh, the rivers named adjacent to the smokehouses, mostly think of names. That's my recommendation. And I don't think it's too late. Uh, it is, it's not trying to be a, a racial issue. Mm -hmm. But I think it's complemented uh, dealing with the state and federal government and saying that uh, that this is also the name of the rivers and run some bigger cats a kid on the 
I think naming the streets is no disrespect. Or naming of the school. And I think it's wonderful that we come just a little bit closer that we're part of the whole state of Alaska, the indigenous people. And I think with the names, we come closer to understanding and working together. And primarily, my comment is directed toward the visibility of the class and the gather near is in the language, but I think it goes a little bit further. I think the voices of the clans are being heard in regards to the language. So I need to comment on that. We have the northern language, the central language, and the northern language. And so we haven't heard the, uh, the importance of the areas, the central, we're here in the northern, of course, and make it possible the central. But we need to help each other. And we need to put the pride, love, and respect back into the voices of the clan. And it begins mm -hmm. with the language. So those speakers that are actually making the comments of the language, I'd like to compliment each and every one of them of people that's involved in teaching or African. Thank you for listening to Chief. Chief. wanted to uh, wrap up the speaking portion of the uh, of the luncheon we still have uh, a half hour before we begin the uh, the breakout sessions but wanted to thank the federal agency to for being here to give uh, at least a little bit of touch on their outreach to tribes uh, albeit they have to go through the federally recognized tribes system but the uh, tribes I know, in, at least the Sega Tribe of Alaska tries to work with the clans, especially when it comes to uh, archeological or any kind of atu that needs to be repatriated. And so when it comes to place names, that's the same thing. Uh, the tribe depends on the elders and the clans to give them information about what the traditional place names are. And so uh, it doesn't seem like we get federal agencies that come to or conferences such as this that are outside the federally recognized system that does an outreach and shows us examples of how they try and work with uh, the, uh, the first peoples. So I want to say thank you again to Beth and for, for Bob. Give them a round of applause, please.